Hey everyone, in today's Wrath of Math lesson, we're going to go over how to construct a relative frequency table. This is a viewer requested video. I always appreciate those viewer requests, so be sure to leave your requests down in the comments. Let's take a look at the data we're going to construct a relative frequency table for. A class of 20 students take a golf exam. They're graded on a scale of 0 to 100, pretty normal. They receive the following grades, and then of course we've got 20 students, so the 20 grades are listed over here in yellow. You might wonder what sort of class has to take a golf exam. Well, when I was in high school, my gym class had to take a golf exam. I absolutely bombed it, so this is first-hand experience. A relative frequency table is just one of many ways that you might choose to represent a data set in order to help analyze the data and make conclusions about it. Before we make a relative frequency table for our data, here's just a quick look at the typical structure of a relative frequency table. First, we have the data column, which of course contains our data. This typically has a row for each distinct data point, or different rows for distinct intervals of data. Then we have the frequency column, which contains the frequency of each data point, or the number of data points that fall in each interval. These first two columns together make up a basic frequency table. If you want to see a lesson giving an example of constructing a frequency table, maybe just for extra practice, or you want a more thorough recap, I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson on constructing a frequency table. And then, nice and easy, the last column that makes this a relative frequency table is the relative frequency column. In this column, we simply take the frequency of each data point or data interval and divide it by the total number of data points. This gives us the frequency of a particular data point relative to the total number of data points, thus the relative frequency. For example, if the data point P has a frequency of 3 and the total number of data points is 10, then the relative frequency of the data point P is P's frequency, 3, divided by the total number of data points, 10. 3 divided by 10, which is 0 0.3. So 30% of all the data points were data point P. But if that's all a little too abstract for you, just hold on and let's get into this actual example. So we can just begin by constructing a basic frequency table, which, as we just saw in the first column, has our data. In this case, our data are a bunch of grades, so we'll call this first column grades. And then nothing fancy, the second column will just be the frequency of each grade. Now we have our first important decision in representing this data. Should we create a row for each distinct data point, or should we sort this data into distinct intervals? Since most of these grades are distinct and don't repeat in the data set, for example, there's only one grade of 72, and I think there's only one 68, that's the case with most of these grades. They're just one. So if we create a distinct row for each score, then we'll have two kind of annoying problems. The first problem is that we'll just have a bunch of rows, and the second thing is that the frequency of most of those rows will just be one, so we won't get anything useful, it won't tell us much about the data. So we should sort this data set into intervals. The intervals we sort the data into is up to us, and this can be tricky. It depends a lot on context and the particular data you have, what intervals you should pick. In this case, since we're talking about exam grades, a natural choice for the intervals to sort our data into are the simple letter grades. So what I mean by that is the first interval will be all of the Fs. These are the scores ranging from 0 to 59. And then the next interval contains all of the Ds. These are the scores from 60 to 69. The next interval contains all of the C's. These are the scores from 70 to 79. The next interval contains all of the B's. These are the, these are the scores, excuse me, from 80 to 89. And then, of course, the A's, the scores from 90 to 100. Now, I'll say a typical rule of thumb is that if you're sorting your data into intervals, the intervals should typically be equal in width. If you choose to use intervals that don't have an equal width, you should have a good reason for making that choice. In this context of exam grades, that's a good reason to not have equal intervals. Sure, the interval of F from 0 to 59 is a lot wider than the interval for B, which only goes from 80 to 89, 
but in this context, these are the categories that we care about. There's not much difference in this context between a 24 and a 55. They're both failing grades, but there is a decent amount of difference between an 85 and a 94. One's a B, one's an A. So I just want to point that out. Typically a good rule of thumb to pick intervals with equal width. But in this context, it's reasonable to have intervals that don't have equal width. It's all about creating a table that helps us read the data. That's the point. All right, now we just have to count the frequency, the number of scores that fall into each one of these grade boxes that we have created. First, let's count up the Fs, all of the grades that are between 0 and 59. So, draw your attention up here to the data set, let's count. 53, that's 1, looking through here, another 53, that's 2, 55, that's 3 Fs, and 24. Total of 4 Fs, so we'll write that frequency there, 4. Now let's count up all of the Ds, the scores between 60 and 69. Once again, draw the attention to the data set. There's one D, keep on looking through, there's a 62, that's a second D, and that's it. Actually, no, there's a 67 as well, three Ds. So I'll write that there, three. Next, we'll count up the Cs, all of the scores between 70 and 79. Begin with that 72, that's one C, 77, that's two Cs, and it looks like that's it. So that's a total of two C's, moving on to the B's. The B's are all of the scores between 80 and 89, so let's count them up. We see 82, there's one, 85, there's two B's, 86, 82, there's four B's, 88, and 81, six B's. There we are, total of six B's. And now we just gotta count up the A's, the scores between 90 and 100. 91, there's one A, 98, that's two A's, 94, that's three A's, and another 94, that's four A's, and then 90, so five A's. And there we are, we're done with the basic frequency table. Now a quick check to make sure that we counted all of the data points. Let's just draw a bar down here at the bottom of the frequency table. Underneath all of that, we'll put the total number of data points, so we'll add up all of these, and it should be 20, because there were 20 students, there were 20 exam grades. 4 plus 3, that's 7, plus 2 is 9, plus 6 is 15, plus 5 is 20. And so the total is 20, as we expect. And now, my friends, we are almost done. We just need one more column now for the relative frequency to complete this relative frequency table. Remember that the relative frequency column contains the frequency of each data point or each data category, the frequency relative to the total, which means for each row, we just take the frequency, so four, the number of Fs, and divide that by the total, the total 20 number of grades. Integers are very easy to divide by 20 because four divided by 20, that's the same as four divided by 10 times two. So to divide 4 by 20, we just have to divide 4 by 10, which is 0.4, and then divide that by 2, which is 0.2. So we don't even have to break out the calculator here. 4 over 20, that's a relative frequency of 0.2. And then what about the Ds? There were a total of 3 Ds relative to a total number of 20 scores. 3 divided by 10 is 0.3. Divide that by 2, that's 0 0.15. Relative frequency of 0.15. Now the C's, there were two C's, so the relative frequency is two divided by 20, that's 0.1. For the B's, there was a frequency of six, six B's, so six relative to the total number of grades, 20, that's going to give us 0 0.3. And then lastly, we have five, that's the frequency of the A's, so that frequency, five relative to the total number of grades, five divided by 20, that is 0 0.3. Two, five. So remember, for a relative frequency table, in the first column, we have the data. In the second column, we have the frequency, the number of times each data point occurs, or the number of data points that fall in each interval, depending on how you choose to sort your data. And then the relative frequency column just gives us the frequency of each data point or data interval relative to the total. So just take the frequency and divide by the total number of data points. 
Now to complete the table, let's just erase all of these unnecessary fractions. Another way we can check for mistakes now is to add up all of the values in the relative frequency column. What do you think they should add up to? They should add up to 1, because together all of these values should make up 100% of the data. So you could think of these as percents, 20%, 15%, 10%, and so on. If we add them all up, should be 1, or 100% of the data. So if we add them up, 0 0.2 plus 0.15, that's 0.35, plus 0.1, that's 0.45, plus 0.3, that's 0.75, plus 0.25, that is 1. We could write 1.00, just so it looks nice. And so it looks good, no mistakes jumping out at us. So what's the use of a relative frequency table? What's the use of a relative frequency column? Why not just stop with the frequency column? Well, imagine you don't know how many students have taken this exam, and imagine you don't have any of this other information. Imagine you just have the frequency of Fs. You're told some students take an exam, four of them get an F. Is that good or bad? And you should say, well, I have no idea. If the class that took the exam had a total of four people, then that's really bad, because that means everybody failed. The way we interpret things is often very relative. It's a pretty meaningless question to ask if four students failing is good or bad without any total or any other frequency to compare to. That's why we like the relative frequency. See, we could do the same thing. Block out all the information so we don't know how many students took the exam, and we don't even have any of the other data. And then you're told, in some class that took an exam, the relative frequency of students who got an F was 0.2. Is that good or bad? Well, I'd say that's pretty good. That means 20%, that 0.2 relative frequency, 20% of the class failed, so 80% of the class passed. That's not bad. So I hope that makes it clear why the relative frequency is so useful. And one last thing, remember when sorting data into a frequency table, or a relative frequency table like this? If there's some logical ordering to your data points, so like if your data points are numbers, and they can be ordered from least to greatest, or greatest to least, you should always order them that way in your table. Either order the rows from least to greatest, or greatest to least. That makes it much easier to get information from the table. Because then, for example, say I want to know how many students got less than an 80 on this exam. All I have to do is find the row that contains the students that got an 80, which is the B row, and if I add up all of the previous rows, that will tell me the number of students who got less than an 80, a total of 9 students. And of course, since this is a relative frequency table, we can also add up these rows in the relative frequency column to see that students got less than an 80 with a relative frequency of 0.45, so 45% of the students got less than an 80. And when you frame it that way, it sounds like maybe it's not so good. Most of the students passed, but nearly half of them got less than an 80. So if you wanted that sort of information, and you didn't order your rows from greatest to least or least to greatest, you'd have to do something weird like carefully looking at each row and say, okay, I want to add this one and, and this one and this one, and that's going to give me the info I want. And that is not a very elegant solution. So that, my friends, is how you craft a relative frequency table and why you would want to in the first place. I hope this helped, and let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching, I will see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet. Link in the description to a recent video where I ate bugs while proving the Pythagorean theme. I hate it when you're not around, Ken. <laughs>